190 is one of the most uncharacteristic Mercedes-Benzes ever made. Not only was it their first small car, yielding a full three-sedan lineup to compete with BMW for the first time, but it spawned the first truly sporty Mercedes in decades. And it wasn't just lip service. When Mercedes says sport, they mean it. The Cosworth-developed 16-valve 190E was a stark departure for stick-in-the-mud Mercedes, and departier still was its fourth and final version, the Evo 2. While it looks like it was created by juveniles, it is a thoroughbred champion and one of the most well-resolved and straight-up epic drives I've ever had. Its characteristics and capabilities make it completely unique. Few people have truly experienced, and even fewer still have actually gotten, its brilliance firsthand. This car owes its existence to the U.S. government. In the wake of the 1973 oil crisis, Congress enacted CAFE, Corporate Average Fuel Economy Standards. Car makers whose fleet was too thirsty faced fines, and in a rush to meet the new standards, Mercedes threw diesel engines into all of their existing sedans. This was a clever band-aid solution, but the real German solution was to design a new, more efficient car from the ground up. Mercedes had toyed with the idea of a small sedan as far back as the 1950s, but was finally galvanized to action by a need to keep selling cars in the critical U.S. market. Development began in 1976, the year after CAFE went into effect. Although the new small car would be efficient, the brief from the board of directors was clear. The new car must be a Mercedes-Benz through and through. So it could not compromise on any of the traditional Mercedes values – quality, technical innovation, safety, durability, or reliability. The board further specified that the new small car's comfort, refinement, road holding, and long-distance touring abilities should match those of the flagship S-Class. As usual, Mercedes engineers were not messing around. The 190, internally designated W201, cost more than 2 billion Deutschmarks to develop and was full of innovations and clever thinking. Its aerodynamic styling was the work of Mercedes chief designer Bruno Sacco, the first fully realized expression of his now famously rational yet elegant design philosophy. Its plan form was tapered while its profile was wedge-shaped with a steeply sloped rear windscreen and high short trunk to improve aerodynamics and keep the car compact while still providing reasonable trunk space. Deformable plastic bumpers were sleek and also met American safety regulations. Under the skin, the innovation continued. High-strength, low-alloy steel throughout the car's structure reduced weight, as did aluminum and polycarbonate in less structurally critical areas. A new family of cross-flow gasoline and diesel four-cylinder engines with aluminum cylinder heads debuted in the W201, while a double firewall insulated occupants from the engine compartment and protected electrical components from weather and engine heat. Using lessons from Mercedes-Benz's groundbreaking C111 engineering cars, the W201 became the first production car with multi-link suspension, a five-link setup that gave the benefits of double wishbone designs, but with additional control over geometry and thus handling. The result was a car that did in fact deliver the road holding and ride comfort of an S-Class in a package that was, compared to the base model W123 E-Class, a foot shorter and 550 pounds lighter. The W201 debuted in December of 1982 with gasoline engines only because the diesels wouldn't be ready for another year. Shockingly, however, just a few months later, a different new engine variant of the car set a series of records after being driven continuously for 201 hours around the Nardo test track in southern Italy. The performance version of the car was ready so soon because its development had already been underway for years. Mercedes initially planned to race the 190E in the upcoming Group B rally category and had developed a 2.14 liter turbocharged sedan for longer events as well as a short wheelbase hatchback version of the car with a 2.3 liter naturally aspirated engine with four valves per cylinder for tight events like Monte Carlo. After Audi's launch of Quattro in 1980, Mercedes concluded that it would be pointless to try and compete in a rear-wheel drive car, and thus the racing program was cancelled. Mercedes management forbade further development of the racing variant of the 190E, but the engineers continued to quietly work on a road version of its 16-valve engine. It would create a genuinely sporty small Mercedes to sell to the public, ideal to compete with the athletic offerings from BMW. Plus, if they made 5,000 of them, they'd be homologated to race in both Groups A and N. 
Multi-valve technology was of particular interest because it would deliver more power while also improving emissions and efficiency, exactly what car manufacturers wanted as they sought to restore performance while also responding to new regulations and customer demands. It was cutting edge stuff at the time. This was years before Ferrari, Lamborghini, or Porsche introduced four valve engines. Mercedes engineers built their own 16 valve version of the new M102 190E engine, but it didn't make enough power for rally use, so they turned to the British firm Cosworth, who had pioneered four valve heads in the mid 60s with their legendary racing engines. They had also developed a proprietary thin wall casting process, so Cosworth ultimately ended up building the heads in England and shipping them to Germany for machining and assembly. Cosworth engineers received carte blanche to design a proper high-performance head for the engine, which used a standard M102 bottom end aside from forged alloy pistons. The Cosworth head was optimized for high RPM gas flow with efficiently designed ports, long-duration cams, and sodium-cooled exhaust valves. The road version went from 122 horsepower to 185 without any increase in displacement. The car the new 16-valve engine was placed in was called the 190E 2.316, and it got a host of other upgrades, including an aerodynamic body kit that included bumpers, side skirts, wheel arch flares, cladding, and even a rear wing, which together reduced lift by more than 40%. Also new were wider tires mounted on flush alloy wheels, which would make their way onto the entire Mercedes model line in the following years. The chassis was upgraded with strengthened suspension mounts, bigger sway bars, lower, firmer springs and dampers, while the driveline gained a 5-speed dog-leg close-ratio gearbox and limited-slip differential. An oil cooler was standard, as were oil temperature and voltage gauges inside the car, along with a digital stopwatch. Recaro sport seats and a 10mm smaller, but still enormous, steering wheel rounded out the interior changes. The car was among the fastest sedans then on sale and was far more sporting than any other road-going Mercedes since at least the 300 SL of the 1950s. To highlight this, Mercedes set up a pair of demonstrations to show just how much performance the 2.316 packed. The first of these was a 201-hour endurance run in which three lightly modified examples circulated the high-speed track at Nardo in Italy at an average speed exceeding 150 miles an hour, including fuel and maintenance stops and driver changes. The run took place in August of 1983, a month before the car's public debut at the Frankfurt Motor Show and the car set records for 25,000 kilometers, 25,000 miles, and 50,000 kilometers. The following May, the new F1 circuit at the Nürburgring opened, and to break in the track and highlight the new Mercedes sports sedan, a race of champions took place. 20 lightly modified 2.316s were piloted by some of the greatest racing drivers of all time. All but five of the living F1 champions participated, and the entry list was epic. Sterling Moss, Nicky Lauda, Jack Brabham, Phil Hill, John Surtees, and Alan Prost, to name but a few. Emerson Fittipaldi was in America preparing for the Indy 500, so his car was taken over by a young, relatively unknown Ayrton Senna. Nicky Lauda had missed qualifying due to a commitment to appear on TV and pushed his way up from 14th to 2nd. Despite this exciting preview of the 2.316's on-track ability, Mercedes was tentative about officially supporting its racing debut because of the motorsports ban. Once the 5,000th example had been built in the spring of 1985, the car was homologated and privateers began preparing and racing them in DTM, showing the cars to be quite competitive, although without factory support they won routinely but didn't dominate. BMW's response to the 2.316, the E30 M3, started racing in 1987, which it did with factory support and won the championship straight away. Because of this humiliation, Mercedes finally relented and in December of 1987 lifted their motorsport ban. For 1989, the first Evo version of the 190E was introduced, which took advantage of rules that allowed more significant changes to racing cars if at least 500 road-going examples were built that incorporated those same changes. For the 190E, this meant a larger 2.5-liter engine, bigger wheels and brakes, faster steering box, lowered suspension, and revised body kit with bigger flares, front splitter, and rear wing. BMW was already on their second Evo version of the E30 M3 at this point, and the 190E Evo 1 still wasn't enough for Mercedes to beat them and the championship in 1989. Things didn't improve for 1990 or 91 when both BMW and Mercedes lost the DTM championship to the new and gigantic Audi V8 Quattros. It wasn't for lack of trying in 1990, though. Both BMW and Mercedes introduced the final Evo versions of their cars, and the Mercedes one was a doozy. 
The disappointing 1989 results showed Mercedes that the 190E needed more development still. The Evo 2 engine revved higher to 7800 RPM and gained a larger throttle body, upgraded intake and exhaust, and upgraded engine management. Wheels grew by another inch to 17 inches as well, but by far the biggest change to the car was its aerodynamics. Desperate for any competitive advantage, Mercedes engaged a professor of aerodynamics at the University of Stuttgart who designed a totally outlandish set of aerodynamic appendages. These caused BMW R&D chief Wolfgang Reitzel to comment that the laws of aerodynamics must be different between Munich and Stuttgart. If that rear wing works, we'll have to rebuild the BMW wind tunnel. They rebuilt the BMW wind tunnel. Together, the rear wing, fender blisters, and aggressive front splitter increased downforce while also reducing the coefficient of drag from 0.33 to 0.29. While the resulting car doesn't look like a factory Mercedes-Benz product, it does look cool as shit. One small problem. The rules forbade a rear wing that interfered with rear visibility. So, they added a cover to the rear window to worsen rear visibility. Letter of the law, sure. Spirit of the law, not so much. The car was announced at the Geneva Motor Show in March of 1990, and the 500 cars were sold quickly enough that the car was homologated on the 1st of May 1990. When the pesky four-wheel drive Audis disappeared halfway through the 1992 season, the 190E finally got its long-awaited DTM victory. A 190E won 16 of 24 races that season, and Klaus Ludwig won the Drivers' Championship driving for AMG Mercedes. All told, the 190E won 50 DTM races and was directly responsible for the existence of the BMW M3. Even in road trim, the Evo 2's looks and competition breeding promise an unhinged driving experience, but the reality of driving this car is that it's incredibly well put together and refined in almost every respect. It has functioning air conditioning, electric sunroof and windows, power steering, and even heated seats. Visibility is good, the dimensions are compact, the clutch is light and progressive, and the engine is quiet and civilized around town. The smoothness of the engine is shocking given how large its displacement is for a four-cylinder, especially one without balance shafts. There are some clues to the car's performance intent, however. The dogleg shifter is a bit notchy and feels mechanical and precise, and the brakes have a high, firm pedal. The suspension is much less compliant than any other 1980s Mercedes, all of which have a fabulously creamy ride. The Evo 2 is purposeful and sporting, more unyielding than a stock Porsche 911 of the era, but not harsh. The steering is quick, perfectly weighted, and remarkably feelsome. The fact that it's a steering box rather than a rack defies belief. Maneuvering the car at low speeds leaves the driver with the feeling that this is an expensively engineered and undeniably sporting car. It is also tiny, three inches shorter than a modern Ford Fiesta. The structure feels robust and the car changes direction with urgency but not nervousness. There's no slack in any of the controls, and the whole car has a barely contained playfulness waiting to be unleashed. This is different from the standard 2.316, which has much cushier suspension, a little bit slower steering, and a less mechanical feeling shifter, all of which make it feel less focused. The Evo 2 revels in being absolutely caned on a technical road, where the constrained eagerness you detected in town can be released, and gleefully. First there's the engine. Quiet and unobtrusive at part throttle and low RPMs, it develops a racy character as it climbs towards its 7800 RPM redline. Its specific output, 95 horsepower per liter, means that it has to be revved to make power and its combination of smoothness and intake bark makes it an absolute joy to keep on the boil. Together with the legendary units from Honda, this has to be one of the best four-cylinder engines ever made. As you press on and leave first gear behind, the slight awkwardness of the one-two shift present in every dogleg transmission becomes irrelevant, and the shifter weight and travel coalesce perfectly with the brake and throttle pedal placement as heel-toe downshifts flow as effortlessly as they always should in a real sports car. It has tons of grip and, best of all, superb handling balance and adjustability. What was low-speed stiffness becomes a fantastic fluidity at speed which keeps the wheels in contact with the pavement and absorbs mid-corner bumps perfectly. The chassis balance allows the driver to dial the handling attitude and the car's playfulness and unadulterated sports car DNA takes center stage. Like all of the greatest sports cars, the harder you push, the better it gets. And every so often, while hustling the car along like a hooligan in a 911, GTI, Miata, or any other damn thing, you look down and see the imperious three-pointed star at the end of the hood and think, this is a Mercedes? This car is so uncharacteristic for a Mercedes-Benz that it's hard to come to terms with. 
Throughout my entire day with the car, I was infuriated by the feeling that you get when you see someone you've met before but you can't remember where you know them from. The car felt so familiar but I couldn't figure out what it reminded me of. The 80s and 90s Mercedes-ness of it was easy to play since I've owned many of those cars. But getting this high quality feel together with the keen chassis, steering and driveline and the engine simultaneously smooth and raucous character blew my mind. It was like meeting someone who combines all your favorite characteristics of all of your exes in a single person. I like this car. Dude, wow. Let's see, is there anywhere out of the way to tell? Oh. There's always something magical about driving a homologation car. The reality that the core technology and architecture of the car that you, a regular old person, are just driving around in was sold to the public not because it's cheap or a focus group said it was what consumers wanted, but because it was what was needed to go racing gives all such cars a purity of purpose that every driving enthusiast will appreciate. Although the Evo 2 assaults your eyes with its looks but does the opposite of assaulting you while you drive it at normal speeds, it is still an epic driver's car. It is instinctive, thrilling, and grin-inducing. But it's also a Mercedes-Benz. This car was designed and built when the taglines were still true. Lines like, engineered like no other car in the world, and built to a standard, not a price. Writing for Car and Driver, Brock Yates described the 190E not as a new automobile so much as a perfect 7 8 scale model of the S-Class. During this period, Mercedes-Benz made the best engineered cars in the world. But this is the only time that they turned all that brilliance towards making a true driver's car. And that's the real tragedy of the Evo 2. Just 502 were made, plus another 502 Evo 1s. Mercedes never did anything close to this before or since, and so this car poses an almost painful question about what the world would have been like if they had continued down this path. Driving this car quickly, you feel an almost palpable sense of loss. What other brilliant driver's cars could Mercedes have built that we never got to meet? But at least there's this one. It looks the part, it sounds the part, it drives the part, and it has real racing heritage. Rare and expensive, yes, but at least it exists, and it is genuinely like nothing else.